just to kick us off, good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are today. Uh, I'm Stacy Fiella. I'm the executive director of the Woodcock Foundation. Uh, I'm really excited about this conversation we're having here and these great leaders who are joining us to share their insights. The topic at hand, as you saw from the agenda, uh, is elevating community voices in international development efforts in order to increase their impact and sustainability. And while there's tons of innovation in the field, there are plenty of really great success stories in the broad landscape of international development. There are also a lot of efforts that ultimately fail. And you know, we said in the session description, both philanthropy and impact investing funds and the projects that they support, unfortunately miss the mark in many cases. And that can range from limited impact to actually causing harm in the places that they aim to do good because they fail to involve the community members in the process. There's very frequently a lack of accountability for development efforts. So in other cases, we don't actually know the impact a few years down the road. And at the same time, there's a growing recognition that community members who are most proximate to the issues that are surrounding them understand them best and are also most suited to help design the solutions that work and that last. There are a range of practices that have emerged to engage community members in due diligence and in project design and planning, but they do vary quite a bit in the level of voice and control that they put into the hands of community members and the level to which they create any accountability, both for their outcomes and for the communities where they're located. The practice of community-driven development involves real listening and ensuring community participation. And at its best, it also centers community voices and leadership in development practices and puts communities into the driver's seat. So our panelists today are going to share some examples of projects gone wrong, as well as models for elevating community voices and minimizing risk and driving sustainable change. We'd really love for this to be an interactive conversation. So please put your questions into the chat as you think of them so that they're queued up for our Q&A. And to kick us off, our panelists are going to provide brief introductions before I jump into some questions for them. Um, so I'm going to go, we'll have Natalie, then Gabino, Sasha, and Nana Ama. Good morning, everyone. I'm Natalie Bridgman Fields. I'm the founder and director of Accountability Council, a global organization working around the world to defend the human rights and environment of communities when they've been harmed by international finance and development. And I'm uh, thrilled to be here at SOCAP again. I'm a former SOCAP entrepreneur and to see so many of you. Good morning. Natalie, uh, oh great, Gabino, thanks. Hola, muy buenos días a todos. Mi nombre es Gabino Vicente, indígena originario de la comunidad de Santa Úrsula. Good morning, my good morning. My name is Gabino Vicente. I am a, an indigenous member of the community of Santa Úrsula in Oaxaca, Mexico. pueblo del municipio de Tuxtepec en el estado de Oaxaca in the municipality of Tuxtepec in the state of Oaxaca. Tenemos la oportunidad de trabajar con la Contability Council desde el 2011. Fuimos pioneros en defender nuestros recursos naturales de la mano de Natalie y su gran equipo de trabajo. We had the pleasure of working with the Accountability Council since 2011 in an effort to uh, defend our community with the, the great team at Accountability Council. Thank you, Gabino. <laughs> Estoy aquí hoy para poder compartir con todos ustedes este proceso que se llevó a cabo eh, de la mano de Accountability Council en estas localidades de Santa Úrsula, Cerro de Oro, Los Reyes y Paso Canoa. Va a ser I'm, muy importante para nosotros. I'm here to share the experience of the complaint process of Cer um, Cerro de Oro, Santa Úrsula, Los Reyes and Paso Canoa, the four villages for which this was a very important process. Va a ser muy importante para nosotros poder compartir esta experiencia, sobre todo con los inversionistas, para que se provee en un futuro poder hacer proyectos sustentables que beneficien de manera directa primeramente a las comunidades antes que a los inversionistas. Es importante desarrollar este tipo de interacción para poder llegar a esta conclusión. 
It's important for us to share the experience of these communities with investors so that investors can understand how to work with communities before an investment is made uh, and before um, the beginning of a project is initiated, and especially to understand the lessons from our communities before an investment comes to a conclusion. Okay. Y es, es la intención de participar en ese día con todos ustedes. Muchas gracias por la invitación. Vamos a, a continuar. This is why I'm here to share these experiences with all of you. And uh, thank you and looking forward to um, being here with you today. Thanks so much. Over to Sasha. Thanks. And uh, Gabino, so wonderful to meet you on here uh, and to be with this uh, great group of folks who are pushing for a new era of, uh, of development and financing. I'm Sasha Fisher. I'm the co-founder and executive director of Spark Microgrants. At Spark, we are changing how foreign aid is working instead of being top-down and prescriptive, imposing solutions on communities facing poverty. Uh, we are initiating a community-driven methodology where community members have the decision-making power over the changes that are in their village, over the capital that's coming into their village. Um, and we are working today in partnership with the government of Rwanda and a number of civil society organizations, primarily in sub-Saharan Africa. Um, and we hope to see a new day where aid is shifted from prescriptive to community driven and that that is the norm. So I'm grateful for everybody who's here doing that. Thanks okay. so much. Sasha. Yeah. So yeah, good afternoon um, from Ghana. Actually, it's afternoon here. So I'm Nanama in Ketiakwedu. I am working at Advocate for Community Alternatives, ACA. We are a US-based organization who has interest in working with West African communities that face human and environmental rights abuses from the extractive industry. And for the years that we have worked in West Africa, I think that our focus most, we have actually focused mostly on uh, providing um, useful mobilizing tools, legal support and advocacy strategies for our community to be able to articulate their sustainable future um, that fit into their unique vision, needs and culture. And we have done these successfully over the years through the help of Park Microgrants um, CDD effective tool, actually known as the Facilitated Collective Action Process. That has really helped us to change the narrative. Changing the narrative in West Africa, where decisions are mostly from top to down approach, and now trying to make sure that things start from the grassroots to the top. So I'm happy to be here to learn, to share, to ask questions. Thank you so very much. Thank you. I, you know, thank you to everyone for being here and a special thanks to Gabina, Gabino and Nana Ama for being willing to share their experiences. My first question is for both of you. As leaders in your, you know, in your communities and the settings where you're working, you've witnessed firsthand what development efforts can look like and how they can actually cause harm when even when a project is designed for positive impact when it doesn't consider the positive the possible negative consequences and risks so it would be great if you would share an example of a project that was supposed to have a positive impact where it was actually at risk of harming your communities and also how did you remediate that situation and what do you wish had been different in that situation uh, and it would be great to kick off with gabino on this one Entiende bien, Gabino? Necesita traduzca? Gabino, no escucho. Está bien, sí, sí escuché. Está bien, este, voy a compartir. Justo les mencionaba en los inicios de la Contability Council en el 2011. En nuestra comunidad tuvimos el intento de unos inversionistas de poder, de querer construir una proyección de planta hidroeléctrica. En... I'll start with that in 2011 with Accountability Council. The story began when a company came to Oaxaca and they wanted to build a hydroelectric project. Fuimos un ejemplo porque las cosas aquí empezaron al revés. 
siempre. We are, para... we are an example because the things began in the opposite way that they should. Siempre para generar un proyecto que beneficie a las comunidades, se debe de priorizar primeramente la consulta. To begin with, the, the company didn't prioritize consultation. Y poder ayudar en ese sentido a que se conozcan cuáles son las necesidades que presentan cada comunidad donde se quiere invertir. They didn't take the time to understand what the needs were in all of the communities where they were seeking to invest. En nuestra historia, primero conocimos de daños. Primero our... afectaron nuestra agua potable. Tuvimos afectaciones en nuestro, un espacio muy simbólico que conocemos como Arroyo Sal. En nuestra historia, the harm was particularly bad around water resources and our precious water resource, the Arroyo Sal, a, a creek. Es el momento en que se empiezan a derrumbar los árboles que por décadas habían estado en este espacio, que empezamos a distinguir que lejos de llevarnos a un desarrollo, a un desarrollo compartido entre inversionistas y comunidades, estábamos siendo afectados. We began to be affected as we saw the trees along the creek be bulldozed, trees that had been there for decades. We understood the harm that was starting to happen. En ese escenario, nos hubiera gustado más tener una proyección de un proyecto de manera integral, de manera consensada con las comunidades, porque tenemos tanto por poder hacer en nuestra comunidad desde el tema cultural, desde el tema ecoturístico, poder hacer proyectos que beneficien a nuestros campesinos, que por décadas se ha estado en la pobreza extrema, como lo es casi en todo el estado de Oaxaca. In our community, what we would have wanted to have was a more integrated, consultative approach that had taken into account our natural resources, the importance of our cultural heritage, of uh, ecotourism projects and other projects that are integral to our culture and way of life uh, in Oaxaca. Y vale la pena mencionar en este momento que nosotros somos pueblos que sí queremos la inversión. Dejar muy claro esta parte. No nos oponemos a la inversión, solamente pedimos que sea inversión de manera sustentable, consultada, compartida, que tenga un beneficio de impacto directo a las comunidades en el ámbito social, sobre todo por la pobreza que prevalece en esta zona de Oaxaca. It's important to note that we are a community that is not against investment. We are not anti-development. We are pro-investment that takes into account um, our needs and our desire to have a sustainable future that takes into account our precious natural resources and our communities. Muchas veces los inversionistas desconocen si se aplica la política de compartir los proyectos con las comunidades. A lo mejor ellos no siempre se dan cuenta, a lo mejor la planeación es distinta, a lo mejor en la planeación se considera la integración eh, social, más sin embargo en la aplicación ya cambia. Investors don't always pay attention to the policies that require them to really consult with local people, to invest with an idea of um, the, the means of consultation of, with communities. Por eso pienso que es muy importante la participación de asociaciones civiles y organizaciones no gubernamentales como es el caso de Accountability Council para que puedan procurar que el desarrollo de rendición de cuentas, de transparencia, sea lo suficientemente fuerte para poder generar este tipo de inversiones con un impacto compartido. That's why it's so important for civil society organizations to be able to work with communities to help them use accountability offices to speak up and to seek accountability when there's been harm and to prevent harm. Bajo el acompañamiento de ellos, pudimos establecer mesas de diálogo de manera ordenada. Tuvimos más de 10 mesas de trabajo. Todas ellas with Accountability Council, we created a negotiating platform and after 10 months, we created a dialogue process through that platform. Y con sustento pudimos soportar que lo que estábamos eh, alegando a favor de las comunidades era cierto. La prueba más grande, se los puedo manifestar esta mañana, es que hoy existe el arroyo sal. Hoy 
lo estamos procurando cuidar, es nuestra agua, es vida y nos pertenece a todos los que vivimos en este gran mundo que se llama Planeta Tierra. With our negotiating platform, we succeeded. We have today in uh, the Arroyo Sal, a live Arroyo Sal. Water is life, and through this process, we preserve the Arroyo Sal. En el pasado, cuando nuestros padres no pudieron defender el tema de nuestro río, famoso río Santo Domingo, que conlleva a generar el río Papaloapan, hoy en el municipio de Tustepet, una de las afluentes más grandes del país de México. Early our ancestors were not able to preserve our main river, uh, the river that's next to the Papalapan uh, Papalapan dam and we're not repeating that with the Arroyo Sal. Por eso cuidamos nuestros recursos naturales y queremos mandar este mensaje. Sí, bienvenidas las inversiones. Sí queremos, necesitamos empleo, necesitamos desarrollo, pero que sea un desarrollo sustentable. Gracias. We're saying yes, we want development, we want investment, and we want uh, investment that respects sustainable development, our need for jobs, and our need for a healthy future. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gabino, for sharing that. I, I really appreciate your pointing out that you are pro-development and pro-investment and that there actually are policies and processes in place in many cases uh, that are, you know, meant to ensure that that will happen, even though we know it's not always the case that communities are engaged in appropriate ways and early enough in the process. Uh, and Nana Ama, over to you would be great to hear your story as well. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Gabino, for for all the all the all the good um, things that you are helping your communities to resist. And I I would want to speak about a story that happened in one of our communities here in Ghana, and I think that for the past four or five years the government discovered cash as one of an effective cash crop. And the four communities where we work in Ghana actually were cited for, like they had the fertile soil and the, the vegetation to be able to grow that cash crop. And so consistently we have seen a lot of communities that have ventured into cashew grow just because it's a good venture that people could get livelihood from. And so we, we entered into one community known as Imwase. And Imwase happens to be one of the communities that had a vast land that is good for cashew. Now, some soldiers from nowhere actually came and were looking around for land fertile for cashew growth. And they went into Mwase, spoke with their chief, and then told the chief the idea of buying the land for themselves. Actually, what is even a difficult situation for the people of Mwase is that they are immigrants who migrated about 50, 50 years ago from the northern part of Ghana and resettled in Mwase. And so for the years that they have been there, the chief who has chosen to terrorize these people, do not respect their, their, their opinion. He care less about the, the power structure that is there. And so he mostly would take decisions for, I mean, that he will not put into consideration the, the, the consequences of what would, um, would, would, would be meted on the people that he is serving. And so this Imwasi community actually are about 1,100 people. And everyone there is a farmer. They depend on 400 hectares of land that they grow many, many crops to survive. And this chief just got up one day and said that, look, I'm giving you guys few, few months. 
Everyone should vacate the farmland. I have sold it off to false soldiers. And these false soldiers are going to take over the land to grow cashew without providing an alternative land for his subject. And what that means actually is that the people will have nowhere to go. They will have nowhere to support their family. And it's an indirect eviction, telling the people that they should move. Even though the cash crop, which is a cashew cash crop, actually would have come into the community, probably the, the strangers would have employed some individuals to work at the farm to also provide alternative sources of livelihood. The chief didn't bother to consult with the community and rather used his position as a chief and sold off 400 hectares of land free of charge, sold it off. And instead of providing them with an alternative source of livelihood, he left them there and said that, look, I am the chief. You have to look for a land for yourself, whether you can have it, whether you, uh, he just didn't care. And so when we entered into that community, we heard about the story. We felt that ACA, as a human rights organization, we could provide legal support and fight for human rights issues. But the way the community was divided and so fragile, we could feel that they feared the chief. Nobody could speak against what the chief has done. They were finding it difficult even to engage ACA as an organization that has come to help. So we saw that instead of providing legal support, it was an appropriate time to introduce the FCAP, which is an all civic engaging tool to properly build the community cohesion level, find a way for them to define their own development trajectory and being able to have the ability to advocate for the things that affect them as a community. And so, when we first introduced the FCAP in the community, we realized that a lot of people were trying to shy away from the fact that it would reveal some history, some secret, and some other dealings of their chief, which probably they felt that the chief could have used charm and sorcery to kill them. And so it took us a lot of time to be able to get people together, to be able to convince people, to mobilize people, to take them through the FCAP and being able to choose their own alternative, um, their own unique vision that fits into their culture. And for the three year FCAP that we have taken the community through, we have realized that community actually always have ideas of how they would want their development to look like. But the truth is that because in Africa, the system of like traditional leadership is very paramount. Nobody can bypass the chief. Nobody can, can bypass an opinion leader to, to share an opinion or to provide any kind of suggestions. And so it's very, very difficult for people to even sit down to decide how they think their community development should look like. They are always at the receiving end, receiving direct instructions from the top. And then just, even if it will affect them negatively, they have no chance to speak against it. And so as we took them through the FCAP, helping to build their, their cohesion, opening their eyes to see how they can envision for their future and choose a best alternative livelihood instead of just embracing cashew farming, which is rather going to render 137 households uh, like uh, uh, homeless and some would actually even would have no land to live on. The FCAP came in to replace that false leadership style that actually would have scattered the entire community. And so we realized that even though it was a quiet moment, it was a difficult situation for the community, it took them gradual process to understand that community development actually is when you have put power into the hands of the people and they are driving their own control. They are controlling how their development should look like. And for the three years they have gone through the FCAP, they have been able to silence the chief. They have been able to advocate strongly using the press. They have petitioned to uh, the Commissioner for Human Rights and Administrative Justice to call the chief to order, which is unprecedented because they told us for over 50 years they have stayed there, nobody has been able to oppose the chief decision.
And as we speak right now, the Ministry of Chieftaincy has written an official letter to the Regional House of Chiefs to halt the activities of these strangers, soldiers who came to buy the land and have actually told the House of Chiefs that they need now to go back to the community, engage with the community, find out what exactly community would want their land to be used for instead of imposing cashew plantations on them. And we are, as AC, as an organization, we are happy seeing this because when we started, it wasn't easy. It was very, very difficult because even at the neighboring communities, fellow chiefs and other opinion leaders couldn't come in to oppose a chief's decision. And for the three years that the community have gradually gone through the FCAP, understanding what their vision should look like and being able to identify their actual needs and what they think their future should look like. It has really caused a, a lot of change in the lives of the community. And it has given a cascading effect to even other neighboring communities who have gone through similar situations with their chief and opinion leaders, trying to also find a way, a better way, such as the Nwase people, to be able to articulate their own vision, to be able to pro, uh, prepare their own sustainable development plan such in such a way that the, 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 the traditional system where leaders and opinion leaders and the chiefs and traditional rulers would impose certain ideas on community would now become a thing of the past. We also realized that ever since the community went through the EFPA and they have been able to prepare their own sustainable vision and they understand why they, they have the need to, to fight for the things that they need to fight for. It has also helped ACA as an organization to better plan and prepare for any legal support that we, we intend to provide. Because we have realized that anytime you'd want to work with community and the community is divided, the community is very fragile and has no sense of direction of how they want their, their development to look like. It is even very difficult as you, the organization that is coming in to partner with them, to work through with them, to let them know the new trend of community driven development, to understand the angle you are coming from. And we have seen a couple of communities that our legal support actually have failed entirely because the community themselves were not involved. And it's also because their leadership, uh, uh, traditional leadership has taken a, a total control of how communities should even reason out, how communities should even think through how their development should look like. And at some point, we even had to ACA back off all our legal support. And comparing what we have used the FCAP for to improve the community's um, uh, power to make decisions, we have realized that even for us as an organization, the, the community, helping community to gain power to control their own development vision goes a long way to help ACA as an organization to better prepare legal support or legal uh, strategies and advocacy strategies that will help uh, uh, place the community in a better position of fighting for their rights, even at the court, at the, at the, at the law court. And so I would side with Gabino that community is do not kick against development that is coming. If there is any better economic livelihood project that anybody would suggest and say that, hey, we have gotten a lot of money, we want to invest into cashew with the people of Mwase, so we'll just come and pick uh, maybe a, a pieces of uh, cashew seeds and grow and make money. It doesn't work that way. People need to understand why there is this coming. They need to even agree whether this new investment and this new development you are bringing is actually what they need. Is it something that fits into their vision? And I think that is what, for the past years, I have been working with community, I've realized that if, if community doesn't understand the vision, where they would want their, uh, the development vision to, to, to go, and you impose certain ideas on them. At some point, it, it divides the community, and the kind of projects you would want to implement may not be successful because there is division in the community, and everybody wouldn't have a very um, uh, 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 vision that they would want to follow. Michelle, sorry. 
I I'm sorry, please let me grab some water. Thanks so much for your story, Nana Ama. I think it's really encouraging to hear, you know, it's unfortunate how your story started out, but so encouraging that when your communities had voice and and power in the decision making process, things really did turn around for you and you were able to achieve outcomes that worked for your communities. Um, and on, on that note, it would be really great, Natalie and Sasha, I know you're all too familiar with these kinds of stories. It's become popular to talk about community participation in the sector. Um, I think there's often misunderstandings around what that actually looks like. So could both of you just explain in a few minutes what your models for engaging communities as decision makers look like and how they actually move beyond the idea of participation to being about control and accountability and, and how do those models address the kind of negative consequences and challenges that Gabino and Nana Ama and their communities are facing? Natalie, I'll turn it to you first. Thank you, uh, Nana Ama. Thank you for that um, in incredibly rich story where there's a lot we can learn and a lot um, a lot to pull out from that story. And Stacey, thanks for the question. Uh, so at Accountability Council, we see communities all over the world like Gabinos, like the one in Ghana that uh, Nana Ama is discussing about the cashew uh, farm land grab um, that that almost succeeded. That That's happening everywhere. We have cases in Haiti with farmers displaced by USAID and the Inter-American Development Bank, by Rio Tinto and Mongolia, um, huge impacts of MHP poultry farms in Ukraine. So really working with um, a, a very common set of populations where people have in common, they were never asked, they were never consulted. It was top down um, decision making that came into their communities, often perpetrating abuse and, and harm even in the projects that were meant to be part of poverty alleviation from a development finance institutions perspective, trying to help people. And so the disconnect that we see um, is countless examples of this where on paper, perhaps in Washington DC or in London or in Manila, on paper, the investment looks great. Um, and there's even sometimes social and environmental due diligence that talks about, about that there was consultation. But then if you peel back what's, what's under the paper and you look at real life, um, often there was no consultation at all or it was with a basically a bought off group, small group of um, non-representative leaders. And for an investor to hear that, you think, well, how am I supposed to know what's going on, right? How am I supposed to figure out um, what's real, what's not when I'm not there? And I think that's that's the story of Accountability Council's work is seeing the, the investments go wrong when they're not starting from the point of engaging with the community around their needs their vision for their future, as Nana Ama put it so well. So what we do as Accountability Council, we're not doing development work, but we're doing support of those communities to have their vision realized. Sometimes their vision is in the case of Gabino's community, they came to a process where they didn't start off knowing whether they wanted the project or not. They needed basic information. And through the information gathering, they realized that project was gonna cause irreparable harm and needed to stop. And so that then becomes accountability's goal in our solidarity with that community as their lawyers, supporting them through dispute resolution um, with the Overseas Private Investment Corporation at the time, which is now part of the U.S. Development Finance Corporation. Um, so our work is supporting communities like that one um, and, and many others through this accountability process. We only work at the request of local communities. And that's a hallmark of our work because we are really trying to flip the dynamic of communities having imposed upon them what others think they need. And so by, by requiring um, any initial engagement with a local community has to be requested very clearly from a community. Um, that's our first mark of whether we're gonna engage or not, even in the support and, and the advocacy. Um, and then we also, we need to do our own due diligence to understand the power dynamics at play within a community. Nana Ama very accurately described, there are often conflicts in um, Gabino's case in Santa Ursula, Los Reyes, Paso Canoa, Cerro de Oro. There are four indigenous Chinanteco communities, but there were divisions within those communities as well. And as accountability council, we don't come in and try to solve those differences. We don't interject our opinions. We have to follow a a local community process of resolving those decisions as a way of moving forward. So these issues are not easy, but that's why um, the other intervention that we've um, created to try to address some of these power disparities and information disparities, along with pointing people to um, 
advocates for community alternatives and Sasha's uh, group Spark Microgrants, we also have a database called the Accountability Console of every complaint ever brought to every accountability office. And these accountability offices, again, they're tied to the international financial institutions that finance the, the projects that can cause harm. There are now thousands of complaints. So we've bundled them into a database so investors can do the due diligence to begin to understand who they need to consult and about what issues. So if you wanna know all the cases in Mexico or all the cases in Ghana that have dealt with um, forced displacement or gender abuse or land rights issues, that's now knowable as a starting point for investigating what harm could come of an investment to make sure that investment decision-making takes into account the potential negative impacts which are likely to occur without uh, close attention to them. Thanks so much, Natalie. It's, it's really notable how your model is focused on shifting uh, voice and power from the development actors that are coming in externally and into the hands of the communities where those projects are taking place. And I'd love it if you'd put the link to the accountability console into the chat so others can take a look at it as well. And I will turn the same question over to Sasha if you could share your model with us at Spark. Thanks, Stacey. Uh, and so great to hear about all this work today. You know, in terms of transforming how it is working, there's one side which is holding the institutions that are doing harm accountable. And I'm grateful for Gabino's leadership and Natalie's leadership on that side. And on the other side, providing an alternative of how can we actually do this in a way that's beneficial for communities where community members have the rights to determine their own future. And at Spark, we believe fundamentally that every village should have the right to determine their own positive future have the decision-making control in their hands uh, to make decisions that are about their future. And so um, as Nana Amma actually described earlier, we've been uh, developing a model called the Facilitated Collective Action Process that taps into indigenous organizing practices and then kind of creates a, a gender equity model within that. So it's essentially an annual village planning process where women and men, young and old, get together to plan for their village's future. And then every village receives an $8,000 seed grant so they can launch uh, the solutions that they've come up with because every village has great ideas and they should have the opportunity to go after them um, without having to like go through all sorts of weird hoops to apply to a, a process that you know is from another country to get resources that they don't you know, know how to tap into. It should be proactively uh, granted to each village. Today, we're actually working with the government of Rwanda on nationalizing that approach so that every village across Rwanda will have that opportunity to drive their own future. Um, and uh, Nana Ama's work in Ghana has uh, gained some demand from district level officials and, uh, and a number of other governments are also interested in taking this up, which is encouraging to see because that's how we get comprehensive reach. Um, and I want to zoom out, though, for a moment just to kind of lay the land, because I think there's a lot of talk about community engagement and participation. And sometimes it can be confusing, like, what does it really look like when it's happening very well? And uh, and so I think it's useful to kind of zoom out and talk about the history and the different evolutions of how development is done. Um, and I'm speaking partially as somebody who's from the U.S. and wants to see the way that we deploy capital capital to be used in a better way. And that's like part of our job is to make sure that that's, that's being done in a, a more appropriate way. <laughs> that's like our responsibility. So the historical model is a prescriptive model, one that imposes solutions on communities, right? Going in and saying, you're going to do cashew farming, or at worst, you know, we're going to take your land and benefit economically from it and displace you and, and benefit from that economy. And that's prescriptive, uh, imposing solutions on an area. Then what's popular today as people are learning that increased community participation actually leads to better development outcomes, you have this whole model of participatory development, which says, let's get some community members to chime in on the process so they can have a say in the cashew project and determine how that cashew project is being done or how the school is being built. But it's still, the project is still being imposed by the organization or by potentially a government institution, and the it's participation, it's not full ownership. So we're advocating to shift to a future that's community ownership over the change that's happening. And community ownership means that it's not just one or two community members participating in a process, right? It's not just the local village elite who are 
participating in an externally driven process. You're actually getting equitable participation across women and men, non-binary, folks of all different genders and ages um, to participate together to collectively decide what their future should look like. And in that model, if there's capital flowing into the village, community members have the final decision-making say, not just input, but the decision-making power over how that capital is used and what the projects are that it's going towards. And that cascades then also to a number of other benefits of what can the community advocate for, what can be done at the village level even without the external capital. Um, and that's the power that is there is immense, right? Because that is people having greater authority in determining their own future and the agency to create that future. And the capital piece is still important, right? It's, it's still useful because that transforms into great local solutions coming to life. Um, and I'm going to just dispel two other myths, if I can. Do I have time for two minutes? OK, the two myths that I hear often about this type of work, one is that it's not scalable. So you have a great community led initiative, but it just exists in one community and like that can't go to scale. But that's a myth. The best, most scalable approaches are actually highly decentralized approaches. Right. They're things like cash transfers or microfinance or what we're calling the facilitate collective action process where the power and decision making is decentralized down to the people who are using that opportunity. So it's actually the most scalable approach, <laughs> not the least scalable. And the second thing is that it's high risk, that how can we trust community members to make their own decisions, uh, which is just silly. It's actually the lowest risk. In development models, there's very, very high rates of failure. And the way to mitigate that failure is actually to have greater levels of community ownership. And the greater the level of community ownership, the lower risk it, it technically is by all evaluations of any project around the world. Um, so I feel like those two things are really uh, good nuggets for us to like go in full force and see, can we realize this future where the normal model is community driven and uh, prescriptive models are really a thing of the past. Yeah, thanks so much for that, Sasha. I, you know, I think it's so important that Spark's model is really about putting full ownership into community members' hands. And it's about creating a process through which they can decide for themselves what they need and then access the resources to make that happen. And uh, we are closing in on the end of our time. So I would like to just bring it back to something that Nana Ama and Gabino both mentioned. They used the word consult and talked about the value of consulting with communities and the consequences of not doing so. And it's such a fitting word to me because we think of consultants as experts. And it really is time that we all recognize that communities are the experts at what they need and we need to treat them as such and act that way. So the best thing that we all can do to improve the success of development efforts, whether it's with grant funding or impact investing, is to consult with the communities from the very beginning of the process and engage them throughout it. And that's the pathway for ethical, effective, and sustainable development. So thank you again, all of you, for sharing your stories and your work. Sasha, if you could also put a link in the chat box around the FCAT model, and if Nana, Ama, and Gabino if you have any other links that you'd like to share about your work, that would be great. And again, just thank you all for, for sharing your experiences and the work you're doing. And Harold, uh, USAID is about to get a new accountability office for the first time. We have a policy shop at Accountability Council in DC working really hard on that right now. So uh, change, change is coming. Amen. Congratulations. Thank you all so much. And thanks to everybody Thank who's been listening and is doing their own great work out there. Natalia, antes de cerrar, quisiera hacer un último comentario nada más. Uh, last comment. Ok. Eh, para a todo el equipo de Accountability, darle las gracias, gracias Natalia por esta oportunidad. Quiero comentarle también a Stacy, vamos a formar parte del nuevo gobierno municipal de Tuxtepet que es el municipio donde se encuentra la comunidad de Santa Úrsula a partir del 2022. Y me gustaría mucho, hice mención de la importancia del agua de nuestro río Papaloapan, que requiere bastante ayuda, es un agua completamente contaminada por precisamente toda la industria 
We have a we have a contaminated water resource in the Rio Papaloapa on our, our main river, and we're going to do a project with the municipality next year to try to clean up this river. Ojalá nos puedan ayudar visitando este gran esta gran ciudad llamada Tuxtepet. Mucho nos gustaría, nos encantaría que tengan alguna oportunidad y desde luego ayudar esfuerzo que nos permitan entre gobierno y sociedad. Hoy vamos a tener un nuevo gobierno con una visión que permite que nuestro medio ambiente sea prioridad total, que el medio ambiente está ah, en nuestra prioridad. I invite you to come and see Tuxtepec, our beautiful city, and this river that we're trying to preserve and clean as part of a government priority as we form a new municipal government. Um, this is going to be a government and civil society and local community project to clean this river. And so this is that's part of their vision for their community going forward, their affirmative vision that they're creating to preserve their environment. De igual and he forma, said thank you, Stacy. <laughs> Thanks so much. Forma, you know. A, a it's nice to see you again yeah. after many years since we co connected at a past conference in person. De igual I, forma, a, a, los, a los inversionistas, decirle que Tuxtepet tiene las puertas abiertas. Tenemos muchos recursos naturales que de manera sustentable podemos participar priorizando siempre el bien común y el bien colectivo. Muchas gracias. Thank you to the investors. Our doors are open. We prioritize sustainable investment in our local natural resources. Thank you. Thanks so much. I did see a couple questions just coming in at the end, so we will try to figure out how to get answers to people on the great questions. Um, but thank you again, everybody.